All right, Toto Mushele Yeshua. Hallelujah. Here we are. So, the word of the Lord came to me saying, The virgin shall conceive and bear a meal child. So, it's going to be sweet. It's going to be slow. It's going to be um, very short. Well, I don't know if it's going to be short. I should never say that. I don't even know when it's going to be short. Never mind that me saying that. Um, it's going to be, it's just, gonna, we're just going to give it, okay? Let's just skip the intro. I'm just going to give it. So, the Bible tells us that a virgin, the virgin shall conceive and bear a male child. All right. When we think of the virgin, we think uh, most of us, at least. Okay, I can't be sitting down like that either. Okay, most of us think of uh, the Virgin Mary. Mo most of us, I said most, I didn't say all. Most of us think of the Virgin Mary. Most of, most of us think of Christmas time. We think of the birth of Jesus Christ. It didn't happen at Christmas time, but the world celebrates at Christmas time. So we just, you know. But we think of the Feast of Tabernacles, then we think of the virgin birth, you know, a virgin conceiving a child and bringing forth a child without a man. So here's, here's what Abba gave me to that. All right, are you ready for it? Get ready, we're going to go deep. The virgin shall conceive and bear a male child. The Bible tells us that we are being presented we are being washed by the water of the word we're being made um like a chaste virgin presented to christ what does that mean what men being made virgins what women being made virgins what does that mean what does that even mean well we're gonna go see the bible tells us that with the washing of the word that's what we're being made into. The Bible tells us that with the renewing of our mind, hey, we're getting away from the world and we're going towards God. It's a new thing. It's a thing that is being done. The mind is being renewed. The heart is being renewed. Everything is changing and aligning to God, not the world. All right. The Bible tells us that the virgin shall conceive and be... What is this? What, what, what is... What is... Okay. It just keeps popping up on the screen. So I'm like wondering, what is it? Okay. So... Restore? Okay. So the Bible tells us that the virgin shall conceive and bear male child. So we understand to the point of a virgin. Virgin is supposed to be a person that didn't have any kind of relations with a man. All right, well, physically a virgin, but or a woman, because we have men virgins too. But we have, beloved, a spiritual sense of a virgin, and God recognizes that. The Bible tells us that the virgin shall conceive. So when we think of it in a physical sense, it doesn't make sense. How can a virgin conceive? How can a woman bring forth a child when a sperm is needed, fertilize the egg? What's going on? But when we look at spiritually, we see different things. We see that it's not a natural thing. It's not to perceive it in the way of carna, a carnal mind. It's to perceive it in the way that God is presenting it. The Bible tells us that... Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So that means that we can tell you about these spiritual things. But it's not going to make sense. Because why? Because the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ himself, won't be teaching them. They wouldn't understand. So if you try to explain this to, let's say, a person like a scientist, a person who is just carnal-minded, they ain't going to listen. They're going to think you're nuts. But the Bible tells us that this virgin are souls. 
their people. You're becoming pure again to the state that God wants it. You're becoming pure in the way that He wants it. So the Bible tells us plainly you're going to be prepared like a virgin bride for Christ. All right, great. But now let's look at this virgin bride because this virgin bride, um, it says that the virgin shall conceive with child. How does conception happen? There's a coming together of a man and a woman to create life or just happens, okay? So when we look in a spiritual sense, What's going to happen to us for us to conceive? What we're going to conceive? Yes. What do we have to do? We have to come together with God, with Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means, just like the Bible says, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. He tells us that if we draw near to him, he's going to draw near to us. Remember, he's not a ripper man God. He's not a forceful God. He doesn't uh, threaten. He doesn't. He, he just wants us to draw near out of our own desires. That's the whole point of the cross. So this virgin bride conceives by drawing near to Jesus. He's the husband. He's the Lord and the maker. Okay, and we're using analogy, so please don't take this in the literal, as well as it is in the literal, but you know what I mean. Don't take it in a perverted sense. Take it in, take it in, take it in small doses if you don't understand, okay? Just take it in small doses. So if we draw nigh to Christ, he will draw nigh to us. The Bible tells us to abide with him and he will abide with us, amen? It tells us that we are one with him. Where does it say we're one with him? He says, I and the Father are one. He is the Father. If we are with him, we are one with him. Amen? He is the husband. He is the maker. He is the one that, for a better analogy, I have none, so just go with it. He is the one who, who pregnates the virgin. That's why we talk about a pregnant woman. The church is like a pregnant woman. So this virgin conceives. Doesn't conceive in a natural form. Conceives in a spiritual form. But this virgin conceives. So we have conceived from the Lord. We are filled with something from him. What is that that we're filled with? What, do the, what does the Bible tell us that we're filled with? What are we filled up with from God? The Holy Spirit. We're filled up with the Holy Spirit. So, which is His Spirit, which is Him. So, we are carrying the Spirit of God inside. We've conceived. When did you conceive? When you received Jesus. When you decided to worship him as God, when you, when you baptized, when the glory of God fell upon you, that's when you conceived, all right? So this conception happened. So this virgin is, has conceived. We have conceived Christ. Christ is inside of us. God is inside of us. And now, just like a baby that has to grow and a baby that has to be nourished this this like how do we say <coughs> okay hold on when i stop talking about the gospel and jesus i start to cough when i stop singing i start to cough i don't understand it but okay so this baby is inside of us because the day that we received Jesus, God allowed himself. We allowed God inside of us. We drew near to him. So he drew nigh to us. So we have the spirit of God inside of us. And it's like a baby that we need to nurture. How do we nurture a baby? How does a pregnant mom nurture a baby? How does she 
keep the baby nourished. She feeds, she eats good stuff, she keeps herself strong and healthy. So, with us with the Spirit of God inside now, how do we keep that strong inside of us? Because if we should stop nourishing ourselves, what's going to happen? The Spirit's not going to die, but it's not going to be as strong. The Bible tells us that the flesh is at enmity with the Spirit. The flesh is at enmity with God. It does not like God. So if we stop feeding the Spirit, that's why it's important to read the Word, it's important to worship, it's important to draw near to Him as He draw nigh to us. Because there are little ways that He releases His glory, He releases His power, He releases and it fills us up, it, it strengthens us. So this virgin conceives with a child. So think of the Virgin Mary, and she just has a child now. Not by Joseph, but by the Spirit of God himself, implanting himself here in her stomach. Just like us, we are carrying something as well. We're carrying the Spirit of God inside. For men, it's going to be strange because you're not a woman, but you can understand the analogy of a woman that is pregnant. So the spirit of the Lord is inside. And if we nourish it, we nourish it with the word, meaning we'll get stronger, we'll yield to him. It's like a woman that's taking care of her pregnancy. It's like a woman that wants the baby healthy. So she has to do certain things, she has to, just like that. That's why he uses the analogy of a pregnant woman we can understand that. So the Bible tells us that the virgin shall conceive with a male child. Why male? Because God is not a female. Okay? So all of them dressing up with lipstick and, and, and blush and, and, and all kinds of things. Listen, God is not a female. He's a spirit. And when he came to us, he came as a man. He didn't come as a woman. He came as a man. So the Bible tells us that... She conceived with a male child. So we know a couple things now. We know that he's male. We know that God's spirit is inside of us. We need to nourish, to keep strong in the spirit. Because we are the one who are carrying the glory inside. This is just, this is, this is flesh. This is like a jar. You know when you have a jar and you fill up this spirit in, or if you fill up of the spirit in a jar, you fill up water in a jar, it's filled, it's carrying something. This is just a jar. It's like a vessel. The Bible says we have the treasure of heaven inside. Just like a woman, when she's pregnant, she'd be like, wow, this is my little jewel. This is my treasure. We have the spirit of God inside. And it's a fight for the spirit to reign. For example, when I'm angry, if I get totally angry, sometimes I will say some very bad words, obscenities, and it's not supposed to happen because the spirit of God is supposed to control the flesh. But when I don't read enough, and when I don't worship enough, and when I'm not praying enough, there's not enough, I'm not giving the Spirit of God, enough permission to override the flesh. And my mind just goes, Pfft. All right? So the virgin shall conceive with a male child. The church is pregnant. For a better analogy, I have none. The church is pregnant with Christ. And we're nurturing the Spirit of God inside and keeping the Spirit strong inside so that we could override the world. When we feel like, um, when I say we, people who smoke and drink and do drugs and have sex and just murder and lie and steal and oh, every wrong thing that you could possibly think of that just is in the mind of the flesh. They are not yielding to the spirit. They're yielding to the flesh. So when we yield to God, he's causing right now in this world, it's dark. 
It's getting darker and darker because Jesus is getting ready to come back. And what we have going on is a wearing down of the church. Satan is trying his best to get us to stop shining the light because he's trying to ruin as many souls as possible before the coming of Jesus Christ, which is very, very soon. So this woman who has the baby is like the church that carries the Spirit of God. Now watch this. The world comes out with things like the alphabet soup. Do I need to say what that is? L G B T E F G H I J K L M N N. You get it, right? So they come out with things like that. They come out with trans and all that kind of crap. They come out with all the abominable things that God hates. Jesus hates it. And now we've got we've got these things around. Look at the analogy. We've got them surrounding us. We've got religion surrounding us. We've got tradition surrounding us. Just like a pregnant woman has a lot of things surrounding her. But certain things are bad for the baby. If she does drugs, if she does alcohol, if she smokes, if she, you get it. If she's violent, if she's, it, whatever it's bad so there's some good things there's some bad things just like a pregnant woman needs to take care of herself the church needs to take care of its self where what's that word again what's that word again the big word of this hour discernment there has to be discernment there has to be a, not a singling out, a, a careful choosing. There has to be a careful choosing of what is good from what is bad. The Bible calls it rightly dividing by the word. The word, in the beginning was the word, and word was with God, and the word was God. The word is the final authority. It is a foundation, it is clear, it is precise. The word is the final authority. Like a pregnant woman will go visit her gynecologist, obstetrician, doctors, and they'll give her a strict, you want a healthy pregnancy, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to listen. The word is the final authority. It rightly divides. The Bible tells us that the word is like a sharp two-edged sword, able to divide asunder, soul and spirit, bone and marrow, darkness from light, truth from lie. It is with precision. Bone and marrow is basically the same thing, right? Wrong. There's a differentiation. If the word of God is being compared to the dividing of bone and marrow, it should tell you that it is precise. If there's anything there that is not the same, it's going to bring it out. Same way with the word and with the world. God has given his word. Because he is the word. He was always the word. It's the spirit. The word is a spirit. The spirit is a word. The spirit is life. The word is life. So if beloved, we... This is becoming annoying. Just give me a second. Okay. So if the word is rightly dividing for us, it's just like the pregnant woman that knows, okay, this is fruits, these are vegetables. This is this, this is that. This is alcohol, this is drugs. This is not so good for the baby. You're going to stay away from those things because it's going to weaken the baby. Remember, the church is pregnant. The church has the Spirit of God inside. The church, just give me one second, just give me one second, okay?
Okay. Sorry about that, but that pipe was irritating me. Okay. The water is dripping, 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 dripping. Okay. So the Bible tells us that the word is like the the layout that the pregnant woman has, but the word is also the baby. Now, when the doctors give a pregnant woman certain instructions and things to do, he knows that, okay, should I say this these times? Because I ain't going to say these times. In normal scenarios with good doctors that care about people bringing forth healthy children, they give them good advice. The Word of God is the same thing. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The Word of God gives us precise instructions that are good for us in this life and in the life to come because he wants us to have both. The Bible tells us that we'll have life and life more abundantly in Jesus. In Jesus. Now, the word is on a mission because the word is alive. Just like the baby inside a tummy, the word is alive inside of the church. The word is on a mission. So I want you to think now about a pregnancy, a woman pregnant, a baby, and this baby is being, you know, it's growing and everything. And now this baby's coming out, this baby's going to bring joy. That's exactly how the word of God is. If we yield to the word, it's going to birth joy. If we don't yield to it, the baby's going to die. Okay, so it's like a pregnant woman saying, Doc, you don't know what you're talking about. Give me that alcohol. Give me that drugs. Give me everything that's not good for me. And I'm just going to bust down on it. And I don't care what you say. The baby's going to die. The baby's going to come out deformed. The baby's going to be messed up. The baby's going to die. Okay? The baby could die. So, the church that carries the Spirit of God is the Word inside. And that Word is on a mission because the Word is the Spirit of God. That Word is on the mission to save, to protect, to love, to give hope, to encourage. That Word is on a mission to prepare Listen, that word is on a mission to, uh, what's that word I wanted to use? To sanctify, to save. That word is on a mission to differentiate, to divide. That word inside is like a living baby that is going to bring joy when it's born. If we nourish the Spirit of God, or if we keep yielding to it, just like we nourish a baby, if we keep yielding to Him, He's going to birth these good things. He wants to. Because He knows that at the end, beloved, which is coming very soon, at the end, we got a place to go, and the Spirit that will live forever has a place to go, heaven or hell. So just like a baby needs to grow and a baby needs to be nourished, the Spirit of the Lord needs permission. So us reading, worshiping, yielding to Him is like feeding a baby inside, growing. We are the baby, by the way. We're growing. Now, the baby inside that we are using the analogy to is the Spirit of God, which is Jesus Christ. The world hates Christ because Christ is God. You just need to look and see what the owner of Facebook is doing right now. What is he doing? He's digging a hole down in Hawaii to hide from Jesus. Why? Because they know that they denied him to get rich. That's in Revelation 6, I think where they said they're digging holes to hide like bats and moles in 
the ground, in the mountain, saying, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb, him who sits on the throne. They know, but they deceived the world and they did their things. The elite is what they call themselves. And now they know he's coming. They have not received the baby inside, which is the spirit of God. They, so they cannot birth the things of the spirit. So this virgin has conceived and bore a male child. Now look at this. The world has all kinds of things going around. All kinds, all kinds of man, all kinds of... A lot of evil, a lot of tradition, a lot of things are going on. And people cannot differentiate what is good and what is God anymore. That's why Abba Jesus kept saying, if you have him, you have the light of the world and you're not going to walk in darkness. That's why the word in the Bible says, Thy word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you have light, you won't bounce your head or bounce your toe in the dark. What if you don't want the light, beloved? If you don't want the light, you're going to be bouncing your head, your nose, your eye, your head. Your, head, your hand, you're going to be crashing into things. It's not going to be good. It's just like that in this world. If you don't have the word of God inside now, it's hard to see what is God and what is evil because they're making the darkness look like something acceptable. They're making dimness look like light. But that's why we have the word dividing with Precision. Precision is like if you take a knife and you just cut it. It's precise. It's a half there and a half there. This is black and this is white. This is gray and this is white. It perfectly divides. So this baby inside that we're using as an analogy is growing inside, this, inside of this woman. Just like the Spirit of God is being nourished to override the thinking of the human fleshy mind and system because the world is trying to get us to gravitate towards that because they know that Jesus is coming they know that he's God and they know that he's at enmity with the world so Satan in his debased thinking and his just dilapidated just crazy thinking he wants humanity to yield to the flesh yield to the world so that when Jesus comes surprise He's ticked off. And when God is ticked off, you know what happens? The great flood happens. But he's not going to destroy the world by flood and water anymore. What is he going to use? He's a consuming fire. So, we've got this baby inside that we're trying to nourish with the things that God says to do. Read the word daily. Worship, pray, meditate upon the word. How do you meditate upon the word? Okay, God, you said this. What does it really mean? Show me. You see, if we tell him to show us, the light comes on. He will gently reveal things to us. He has ways and means of doing it. And then, beloved, we get stronger and stronger. We begin to be nourished in the Word. But if we don't, if we don't meditate on the Word, because you could receive a Word, like right now, and Satan will come and say, that's garbage. I'm just snatching that away from your mind right now and go with it. That's why Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer planting seeds. Some fell on good soil, some fell on the rocks, some fell on the wayside where the birds just pick it up and eat it. And some, well, the ones that went in the soil, they could grow. They could become something powerful, something strong. Just like a baby being, grow, um, being nourished inside of a mother's womb. Just like the Spirit of God being empowered or given permission to grow and override the flesh. So we have the word of God that is needing 
permission to override our choices, override our flesh, to override everything that the world loves and Satan loves. Remember, that's how Satan got Eve to eat in the garden. Psst, check out the fruit. Take a bite. You don't have to take a bite yet. Just feel the velvety. Feel it. Touch it. Oh. When she had to touch it, she had to smell it too. She had to look at it too. That's why these and these are very important. And what you put in them will determine what kind of spirit is inside of you. So, the virgin shall conceive with a male child. Yes, we could think of the Virgin Mary birthing the Christ. But now, let's go deep because we ain't no babies anymore. We're drinking the milk, but we're also eating meat. And it's time for the meat. Christ, Jesus Christ, is the baby inside. We are being washed and prepared as a virgin bride to Christ in that analogy. We're being prepared and washed like a people that is ready for the glorious appearing of God then. We are birthing the child, meaning we are birthing the things of God, the things that the Spirit of God loves, what God demands, what He chooses, what makes Him God. We're choosing that right now. So we're the virgin that's birthing the male child. We're choosing the things of God. So the virgin shall conceive and bear a male child. We're the church that is birthing Christ. Now, don't think literally because it's not literally, spiritually. You feel like raging. No. But Jesus inside says, be, be still, be quiet, be calm, calm down. You feel like holding grudges. Jesus says, no, I'm, I forgave you, forgive others, forgive them. He's, he comes in with things like, I feel like giving up. He says, no, endure to the end. Things like the fruits of the spirit. I hate, no. He says, you will love. You will do agape love. I feel like just not believing in anything, God. No. You will believe. Faith will arise. You will believe without seeing and it will manifest. Realize it's the fruits of the Spirit that I'm calling out, right? Because that's what He wants. That's pleasing to Him. I feel like being puffed up and prideful because I can. No. The sacrifices of God are a broken heart and a contrite spirit. That's what you're going to bring forth. So, okay, so these things now, they sound nice. They are nice, but look at this now. Hmm. How are you going to nourish these things? How are these things going to really, really be birthed? How, how are we really going to choose these things? By the washing of the word. What does that mean? It means that all the things that we feel, when we read the Bible, we're nourishing the Spirit of God to override the, the, the flesh. And we're washing away the hatred. We're washing away the pride. We're washing away the rage. We're washing away the, uh, the, the, the giving up. We're washing away the little strength. We're washing away the things that God does not stand for. And now all that's left is pure. It's beautiful. It's good. It's him. So, the virgin shall conceive with a male child. Conception, yes. But the baby is growing. And not just that the baby is growing, beloved. But now we are pushing like if a woman has to bring forth a child. For an analogy, of course. We're talking about analogies here because men, just go with it, okay? It's an analogy to understand pregnancy. 
When a woman has to birth a child, she has to push. If we have to birth these things in the spirit, we have to push. And without pushing, what does that mean? We have to be strong-willed. We have to desire heaven. We have to choose God. We have to love God. We have to love truth. We have to be willing. We have to understand that we have choices and God will not override those choices that we choose. He will only move in what we choose. He will only um, manifest what we choose. He's not a raper man. He's not a forceful God. He tells us, hey, you got your choices. Later comes the consequences, but you still got your choices. You could choose what you want, do what you want, how you want, and that's fine with you for now. But later, my dear, you don't get to choose. Later, you deal with the consequences of your choice. So have your way. Choose. If you want to be humble, if you want to be prideful, whatever you want to do, and God leaves us to it. So us now being the bride that is birthing child, because we have to birth the things of God, we have to basically choose to bring forth these things. And why would we choose these things when the world likes the other things? The world likes raging, the world likes giving up, the world likes worldliness, the world likes pride, the world likes faithlessness, the world, you get it. If this is in front of me, I don't need to believe it for it to be here. Faith doesn't need to be present for me to see this. But if it's not here, and I have to believe for it to be here, now I'm challenging God. Now I'm showing him that I trust him even though it's not there. Okay, God, do your thing. It's not there, but I know it's there. Somehow, it'll get there. He uses people to do it. So, we have, we're birthing Christ in a world that hates him. Is that nice? Do you think bringing forth a child is nice? You should hear women curse in the delivery room. They choke, they kick, they cough. Doctors, nurses, people next to them. It is no easy pain. That's why the analogy of a pregnant woman is used. So let's read it. Let's find the um, scripture. The virgin child conceived with a male child. Something happens. So we're going in Isaiah 7, 14. Now look at this. It's a key. 7 to 14 goes twice. So it's 7, 7, 7. It's three sevens. See that? Isaiah 7, verse 14. But in order to catch the meaning, we go to read the before and the after. So Isaiah the prophet says, Then Isaiah said, Hear now, O house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel which means God is with us. And by the time he knows enough to reject evil and choose good, he will be eating curds and honey. Hmm. So this baby has a purpose because when Jesus was born from Mary and he, well, you know, he's now growing up because he had to grow up like a man. Why? Because we grew up like, well, I'm not a man, but you're a man. Mankind, then, we grew up in the flesh. He, that was the wager in heaven. He had to come down as a man, God in a human body, and only choose the things of him, not humanity, not the flesh, not the world. 
So remember the nourishing that was going on now? Now we're birthing the child. And the Bible says he be what? He be eating curds and honey. Anybody remember what happens to me when Abba says, I want you to go and fast. Or it's time to eat the honey and the milk and the nuts and the, the thing that he gave me when he's putting me on a consecration kind of thing. That means he's going to birth something big. He's bringing out revelations and he wants me sanctified, set apart. Whenever you see curds and honey, it means that that person is being sanctified to God. I'm not talking about religions that take from the Bible, like this crazy Hinduism crap. I'm talking about real prophets of God who are holy men of God, that John the Baptist, he came out eating grasshoppers and honey. That's what he ate in the wilderness. The honey is there. The honey points to something sweet. The word of God, Jesus Christ's name itself is like honey on our lips. It's sweet to say his name. His name is wonderful. It chases Satan into darkness. It is the best thing ever. So this virgin is carrying something beautiful, like the church is carrying the Christ child. But it's not the Christ child anymore. It's just like a baby's nourished. The Spirit of God is inside of us in Jesus Christ himself as a grown being. He is God. It's not a baby. It's not the baby Christ. It's fully God now. And he wants permission to override the flesh inside of us. He wants permission to override the world around us. Yeah, he wants it. So just like Mary would have birthed Jesus and grown up Jesus, and now he's at the age of feeding on the curds and the whey and the um, honey, and uh, now he's in the temple, or the church, which is what they call the temple, uh, listening to the elders and teaching the elders at just uh, eight years old, 12 years old. Just like that, the Spirit of God wants to move in us because it's not a baby in this season. We've been nourishing the baby, and now we're birthing. When we're birthing something, what happens in the birthing process? A lot of things happen. The water breaks. And I heard, um, who was it? I think it was Brother Freddy. It was Brother Freddy. He did a beautiful revelation with the breaking of the water. But here I come with the breaking of the water as in pregnancy. Because the Bible says that um, my God broke through my enemies like the breaking of water. But in this instance, I want you to think of a woman that is bringing forth a child. A water breaks first. And you say, oh, we had to go to the hospital. All of that is when contractions start. The baby is coming. The thing that God has purposed in the church is coming. What has he been purposing? Why have we been told to read the Bible and worship and choose him and choose him above everything? Why? Because he is coming. And what is he coming to do? Rapture. He's coming to show himself strong. He's coming to show himself as the living God. He's coming to show the world that he is who he says he is. And the church is preparing for it. So just like the joy a woman would receive when she, she has a baby, oh, she's got the precious little baby now that she's been carrying. The church is getting ready to celebrate the coming of God, Jesus Christ himself, with all that we've been carrying all that we've been trying to do to nourish and just give the spirit of the Lord permission over us. 
The church is coming into the season of the birth. And it's right around the corner. Right now, it's a lot of contractions, meaning a lot of pain, a lot of hurting, a lot of wearying. You ever saw a woman when she's pushing, 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 she gets exhausted. She becomes so exhausted and you have to encourage her. You have to help her sometimes. That's how the church is in this season. And we have to encourage each other. With what? Just like the, the woman will hear, I see the head crowning. The Bible tells us to encourage each other with these words. And the Lord shall descend with a shout. How did God create things first in the very beginning? Let there be light. A shout. The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of an archangel or the archangel. With the trumpet sound. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive shall be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. Yes, it's coming. That very moment that we've been anticipating all through these centuries and all through the centuries and thousands and thousands of years 6,000 we're coming to the 6,000 year of the earth it's now time to rejoice because the baby is coming the reward in other words is coming he says to cling fast to what you have if the woman will stop pushing, if she stops in the middle of giving birth, the baby will die. If we give up in the middle of this before Jesus comes, we're not going to be ready. We're going to fall away. We're not going to be looking up. We're going to be looking around. We're going to take our eyes off the prize and stop pushing. We're going to stop nourishing. We're going to stop focusing on the joy that is to come, just like the woman has to focus on the baby that she's going to birth. Don't you dare take your eyes off the prize. Don't take your eyes off the prize and don't stop pushing. You have to choose the things of God no matter what. So that's what he laid on my heart about the virgin and the male child. Because we right now are giving the Spirit of Lord permission to do, to lead, to override, to conquer to bring us out victoriously if we give up now the baby the baby's gonna die not to say Jesus is gonna die because he already died and rose again but we're talking about you're gonna lose your hope you're gonna lose sight of the price and heaven is worth too much to worth it to lose the sight of that prize. Why do you think Satan's running amok in the world? He knows what he did. He realizes that he has no forgiveness for what he did. And he cannot go. And he didn't, you see, if he knew, if he had recognized that Abba Jesus was the one on the cross, that it was God, they would have not crucified him. That's why he came the way that he came. Lowly and meek in a stable. Nobody will ever guess it. But when a king is born, what do they do? They hold a party. The kingdom rejoices. They anoint and they this and that and the other. And everybody knows. But that's why when Jesus was teaching, when Papa was teaching the people, when he was walking around him, he says, don't tell anybody. You got healed, but don't tell anybody. Because he wanted to be around us more 
and not have them know who he was, who he is. Because they wanted to end him. They wanted to kill him. You wanted to be around. You wanted to teach. You wanted to, to show the way of heaven and how heaven operates. And we have to choose that. It's hard. It's not easy. It's like a woman pushing to bring out a child. It ain't easy. But we're going to choose it because the prize that's coming is worth it. Heaven is not far away. The Bible says that the kingdom of heaven is right here because we have the Spirit of God in here. Duh. So, when we have the Spirit of God in here, the kingdom of heaven is not far because where's heaven? Where God is. Question is, did you give up on him? Or are you still clinging to him? Because the Bible says that in these last days, people will say, Oh, you know, you said he's coming, he's coming. Nobody's supposed to really put dates. Because then you'll raise the hopes of people and they'll see the dates pass and then nothing. They said things have been happening the way that it has been from the very beginning of time. Till Father Abraham and uh, Noah and Jeremiah and all the prophets and everybody fell asleep died and things are just happening there's nothing different the bible says that they would say that but if you ask a person who is 200 years old 300 years old 100 years old if things were like this when they were younger they'll tell you no things have amplified things have changed beloved things have changed because we are spiraling to the glorious appearing of Jesus. Our God is coming. The one that is holy God. And still, until his judgment day, until he is ready to exempt judgment, he's not going to reveal himself as the Father because he wants us to seek him out. If this is pure towards him, if you say, God, I really want to know you, and I don't care what I find, as long as I know the holy and true and perfect and good God, I don't care what I lose, I want to find you. Bam, you're going to find Jesus. He's going to reveal himself because you've already surrendered yourself like that to him. That's what he wants. He says, if you seek me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, you find him. You find him. And when you find him, never going back. I'm never going back. Amen. So that's what he laid on my heart. Because he's coming. And we are spiraling through the Daniel prophecy. We're spiraling through it. 1,335 days, beloved. My heart beats so fast when I say that. Mm, he's coming. So we are spiraling to that from the day they started to stick people all around. It's really happening. And we are alive in this generation to see it. And what if it doesn't happen? It will happen because everything is coming to pass. When we saw the U, uh, mm, mm, you know what I mean? When they put up the guardian of peace and security of the world and they put the Revelation 13 to statue, perfect description, exact to what the Bible says, like a leopard, like a bear, like a lion, like a with the wings of a dragon. They were showing us, mocking us to the time that we're approaching. And ha ha, the world doesn't get it yet. Ha ha, Revelation 13 2 coming to pass in your face. Yeah. It's sad. 
but I give thanks to those who did not take thee because Jesus is your God you belong to him that's why you didn't take the serpent bite lies and deception of Satan that he wants to get inside because he knows that Jesus is inside he wants he's it's all Satan's really wanted he wants worship and he knows that he can't get inside because he's not God. He's a created thing. So what he wants is the world at touch of the button. And that thing has nanotechnology in it. That thing has enzymes in it called luciferase that goes into your blood and changes it. That's why I've been telling people, renounce it. Get to renouncing it something beg for the mercies of god please to mark the number in the image and um i've got an insight about the image oh give me strength i love you give me strength when i'm weak it's then i'm strong that's why we can do all things in jesus christ if he's inside, kingdom of heaven is inside. Every good thing that God is, is packaged and given to us. All we have to do is receive it, Jesus Christ. Our heart becomes strong, our minds become strong, and even our very bodies become strong. And even if we die a physical death, we're going to live spiritually. He's going to bring us back. Then you hear the dead proceeds the living. The Lord shall descend with a shout. And who's coming up first? The dead in Christ are coming up first. They're the ones that get to meet him first. We don't. Because they already served and they chose him and they died when they died with him. Because how we die is how we're going to be risen. It's serious. Get Christ, please. Tomorrow's not promised. And there's only confession while you're alive. That's why Satan's trying his best to, and just people. Every single thing that he could possibly try to do, he's raising religion, he rose Islam, he rose the Antichrist spirit. That is to seek out the real Christians to end them. You know what I mean? T-I-L-L. -L. It shall come to pass, those who kill you will think they're offering God a sacrifice. Satan is so desperate right now that he just wants to seek out. You see like how we're telling you we're being the light and he doesn't want the light to shine because the world's becoming a place that's dim and, you know, it's close. So you can't really tell unless you've got some Bible in and you really say, okay, this is darkness, this is light. Serious. So I'll leave you with these things. I'm not going to add to it. I'm not going to take away from it. That's what laid on my heart. If you don't know Jesus Christ, what are you waiting on? What? Why haven't you confessed him yet as Lord? Pray with me. Say, Father God, I come to you a sinner. Sorry that I sinned against heaven and here. Thank you for coming as Jesus Christ, living a perfect life for me, blameless and sinless, dying in my place for my sin and my unrighteousness, and raising from the dead on the third day, giving me victory over this life, death, hell, flesh, traditions, world, Satan, death, and hell. I said that already. Say, thank you for um, saving me. I forsake all religions and traditions of men. And I confess you now, Jesus Christ, as my personal Savior. Go on, and my Lord God. That's all you need to do. Say, be shepherd and Lord of my life, and I'll follow you all the days of my life. And he will. Let me pray for you. I lift up this one before you. As you said, better save this one safe sinner that confesses you. The 99 people standing in a crowd saying they're, they don't need you. This one. 
of all the stress and all the trouble that they went through. I stood in boldness to declare you as personal Savior and Lord God. Let your peace that surpasses all understanding be with them now. Your grace that is enough shine upon them, Father. Fill them up to move every obstacle. Open the path in their lives. Open the way. Shine your light and show them who you are in a mighty way. And show them that the things that you do, the glorious. Fill them up with your amazing love. Let them know that there's no greater love than yours. You demonstrated it on the cross when you dropped your robe and your crown and you came down as our Savior. Lead them to a Bible-believing person that they might be well-nourished in the Word to receive your glorious appearing. Lead them to the waters of baptism where they might be baptized by the water and the Holy Spirit. You will fall upon them, Father, as the Holy Spirit. You'll fill them up and equip them for the times that is at hand and is coming very shortly. Papa, help them to know that heaven is rejoicing for them. Give them the assurance of knowing right now that if they were the only ones on this earth, you would have come and died that same horrific death for them on the cross. And even now, we welcome them into the kingdom of heaven. We cast away disease and sicknesses from them now, in Jesus' name. Give them an unction of your Holy Spirit, a portion, until you fill them up, Father, at their baptism. Thank you, Papa. Beloved, we welcome you to the kingdom of heaven. It's not an easy journey. It's where battle really begins because you just chose God's, God's side. But we're here with you. We're here to encourage you and we're here to stand with you. As long as we can. Begin to read the Bible, you'll grow daily. Faith will arise. And you will do some pretty amazing things. Because God will be strengthening you as Jesus Christ. He loves you with his amazing love. And remember, if that time comes that you have to die physically, he has a glorified body prepared for you. Just like he conquered death. You already conquered death in him. So rise up in that anointing right now. Rise up in that fire. Rise up in that power. And know who you are in him. He loves you. You have to be baptized. Go and be baptized. He didn't need to be baptized, but he did. Why? To show us. He said, come follow me. So even if we were just saying, Jesus, we're following you. He baptized. He didn't have any sin. But he wanted us to follow him. You see, Satan's kingdom is the marine kingdom. When we do that, we override him. That's what's going on. So we welcome you to the kingdom of heaven. Welcome, welcome. Big hug. We love you. Big hug. You are more than a conqueror in Jesus. And he loves you with his amazing love. He loves you and he'll continue to love you, beloved. He loves you and he'll never stop loving you. Never stop loving him. Shalom, shalom. In Jesus' name, shalom. Hi, I see you.